Welcome to another recorded le lecture of the course Literature and Identity in the Middle East. I'm Dr. Nikolsky and I'm the teacher and coordinator of this course. In the first part of the course, we learn an analytic method called textual theory, which we use to analyze literature from the Middle East. We follow the introductory book describing this theory called Textual Theory and Introduction, written by Joanna Gavins. And we use this approach to analyze short stories from the book Gaza Writes Back, which is an anthology of short stories compiled by Rifat al Arir. The second part of the course focuses on identity issues in Palestinian society. Today, we start learning about textual theory. I will first tell a bit about the history of this approach, and then I will summarize chapter one, conceptualizing language, and chapter two, participating in the in discourse of Gavin's book. Then as usual, I will analyze some stories and I will end with your assignment for this week. The initiator of textual theory was Professor Paul Wirth, who was a professor of English linguistics in the University of Amsterdam from 1986 until, until his untimely death of cancer in 1995 at the age of 52. His 1972 PhD thesis from the University of London is titled On the Semantic Representation of Relative Clauses in English. He very quickly moved to work on discourse analysis and continued in what can be called cognitive linguistics. His first book, which you can see here, Text Worlds Representing Conceptual Space in Discourse, was published posthumously and edited by Mick Short, his colleague from the Poetics and Linguistics Association. Worth book can and should be placed within a serious debate about linguistics, or rather not a debate, but efforts to debunk a certain linguistic theory, which became hegemonic. But in spite of having many good qualities, this hegemonic approach, it also has many faults. This is the generative linguistic theory with generative grammar, which was established by the American linguist Noam Chomsky. Worth says in his introduction, I have been a discourse grammarian or text linguist for most of my adult life. This was never actually illegal in generative linguistics, at least among, cons among consenting adults, but was rather frowned on. That is, the real linguist don't do text syndrome. Worth was waiting for generative linguistics to become more wide scope, but he realized that the theory of generative linguistics excluded almost everything that did not fall into a very restricted area of syntax and phonology. Here is what Worth says. I strongly believe that the much overdue examination and overhaul of our basic meta assumptions and the new direction which will inevitably result from this will make the subject scientifically respectable. Indeed, by returning the discipline of linguistics to a more human level, we will in the long run ensure its future. So what is generative linguistics and what is different in Worth's and others' approach to language? Chomsky's main goal, and I'm following Worth in describing it here, was to explain the human language faculty. De facto, what generative linguistics study almost exclusively is syntax, and they neglect most other areas of linguistics. The idea in generative linguistics is that humans have an innate capacity for language, a language organ, so to speak, in the brain. And this capacity will develop whether they, are, they humans, are taught language or not. This is why children learn language so quickly and ingeniously. 
say the people that support this theory. So that at the age of four, they know a language even before they can tie their shoelaces. One of the characteristics of this innate language quality is to understand a sentence. That is a combination of a phrase about someone and a phrase about what this someone is doing. This, for example, is a typical generative linguistics type of analysis. The sentence S comprises of a noun phrase, NP, the dog, and a verbal phrase, VP, ate the bone. The noun phrase comprises of a definite, uh, definite article, D, and the noun, dog. The verbal phrase comprises of a verb, eight, and a noun, and a noun phrase, NP, the bone, which has a definite article, the, and a noun, bone. So they extract a very simple structure, which is then embedded one in the other to create the complexity of language. Embeddedness, that is recursion, is therefore another important principle of generative linguistics. According to them, it can happen ad infinitum. This has been challenged by some linguists, but more than the issue of recursion, the idea of language organ has been challenged, not only that it was never found biologically, but also the argument for its existence was found faulty. Worth says that generative linguistics, which he sees as a system viewpoint that takes mathematical rigor as its idea, demands that linguistics should be as rigorous as hard science, relying on an objective system of rules and conditions, and that these elements are meaning-free, existing object objectively, that is, separately from human mind and body. In contrast, he calls his kind of linguistics human linguistics because it focuses on what people actually do. Worth says that there is no language without people. The term human in Worth's uh, ideology is in line with what the philosopher Hilary Putnam said and is part of the pragmatic philosophy. As you can see here, this is also from Worth's book, The Principles of pra Pragmatic uh, Philosophy. It basically prioritizes human experience over mathematical ob objective, so to speak, uh, truth. Worth claim is that language must be viewed as a phenomenon which is intimately bound up with human experience. And in terms of uh, methodologies, it should not start with the preconceived idea of language organ, but one should see it as, this is on page 20, joint effort on the part of its producer, the producer of uh, language, and its recipients to build up a world within which its propositions, the uh, propositions of the language, are appropriately formed and make sense. And one should not think that language is automatically understood because of an inherent human quality. The more consistent term, which uh, Worth calls here world, is text world a term which he borrowed from Turn van Dijk, who was a professor of uh, discourse studies in the University of Amsterdam. He's now retired since 2004, and he's now teaching in MA and PhD in Barcelona. So he's the one who coined the term text world, which Worth is then using. Worth did not write the book Text World Theory from which we will work. This was written by Joanna Gavins. She's a professor of English language and literature at the University of Sheffield since the year 2000. She's doing research in the relationship between language and literature and cognition. She was one of the people who helped edit Worth's book. The book begins with uh, one of Gavin's favorite text types, 
judging from the number of such uh, texts in a book, a lonely heart ed. Old cockerel seeks head to scratch around new pastures. Ex farmer, 57, seeks lady, 45, 55, without ties to move to Hants, Dorset and develop a natural, self sufficient lifestyle. S. E. Call 0905 123 4567. Voice box 20 ABC. Soulmates. The Guardian. The 15th of January 2005. It was not the intention of the reader of a discourse uh, analysis book to see such a text when opening the book, nor was it the intention of the person behind the text, behind this ad, to have a student of linguistics uh, read uh, this ad. However, this short text of a farming metaphor, together with the personal details, make clear to you, the reader of it, many details about the person who wrote it, his age, his occupation, location, ex-farmer from Southeast England, and his needs, a guardian reader, a single female between the ages of 44, 45 to 55. The point is that the text invokes an image, a mental representation in the mind of the reader, and in the case of this lecture, also the listener. This image is triggered by the text, again, written or oral, and it is therefore called text world. All languages are processed in this way. They create a representation, a text world, in the mind of the listener or the reader. The text serves as a trigger to invoke a set of memories or knowledge in the listener. Scientists found out that human cognition works in scripts, interpreting new information according to models already familiar from the past. The simplest and most uh, famous example, which everyone uses in their, um, uh, in their work on these, is uh, the restaurant script, which contains information about how to behave in the in the situation of uh, of a restaurant? What is what are our expectations of it, such as uh, service, ordering, eating, paying, uh, a menu, and so forth? These uh, sets were named in the research uh, scripts. Yeah, this is one name: uh, schemata, mental models, cognitive models, frames, mental spaces, or conceptual frames. It depends on the field of study and on the theoretician. Watch here how a restaurant script goes wrong when it meets a library script. Hello, I'd like to order french fries, a burger, and a milkshake. This is a library. This was in fact an uh, advertisement, but I cut out uh, this part of the, of the film. So human knowledge is not made, of, made up of uh, many small uh, experiences, but from models in which many details can find a place, like a map. A map could be a very detailed one, but it could also be a very not detailed one. You know, uh, but every point in the real world has a representation in the map. Through our linguistics interaction, we constantly and effortlessly create mental representations of situations which we have never experienced, based on details other people provide us during the process of communication. And our image is based on our evoking our past experience. When we talk, listen, write, and read, we are able to understand one another through the creation of not just one mental representation, but often many dozens of them at once. Understanding human communication in all its experiential complexity is not easy at all. Therefore, many cognitive linguists avoid dealing directly with context. Perhaps the most obvious reason for this is its unwieldy nature 
which appears incompatible with rigorous linguistic analysis. Gavin quotes this following example to exhibit how easily miscommunication can creep in even the simplest face-to-face -face exchange. She herself is a speaker uh, one in this dialogue, S1. S1, excuse me, sorry, I'm new round here. I'm looking for the Hollies Medical Center. Is this St. Andrew's Road? S2, oh, er, yes love, yes it is. If you just follow it round and up the hill it's on the right hand side at the top of the hill, opposite where the old church used to be, where they've built the new flats, it's a big old house on the right hand side. Guffins was asking an uh, elderly woman in Sheffield for direction while being new to the area with the aim of eliciting detailed directions to a place she never visited before. She was making predictions about the knowledge the elderly woman has of the area, as well as signaling to her the extent of her own background, of being new to the area. Some of Gavin's clues are missed by her co-conversant, and thus Gavin's ability to construct a mental representation of how to reach the medical center was complicated. When the woman said that her destination is opposite where an old church used to be, where obviously Govins did not know about things that used to be there. If such a brief, apparently simple exchange can in fact involve such cognitive complexities as speculating about the content of someone else's knowledge structure, imagine what the proper consideration of a context surrounding an extended, let's say, political argument uh, might entail. But textual theory, and here I'm quoting uh, Gavin's uh, from chapter nine, takes its commitment to, experien to experientialism seriously. It aims to provide a framework for the study of discourse, which is fully sensitive to all the situational social, historical, and psychological factors which play a crucial role in our cognition of language. In keeping with its cognitive principles, it attributes primacy to human experience of language and takes the face-to-face -face interaction between living, thinking human beings as a prototype for all other aspects of communication and cognition. The content of this interactivity, as well as the context surrounding it, is the subject matter of the discourse world level. Yeah, the concept is discourse, discourse world. Text world uh, theory starts the analysis by relating to the environment where the interaction takes place, its context, its surrounding, the, uh, the subject matter, uh, all this is the first level of text world theory analysis. And dealing with this is not always very easy. Discourse world. The conscious presence of at least one speaker or writer and one or more listener or readers is essential for a discourse world to exist. This discourse world contains not only the sentient beings participating in the discourse and the objects and entities which surround them, but also the personal and cultural knowledge those participants bring with them to the language situation. In face-to-face -face communication, time and place is shared or are shared by the participants. Although, as we will see later, this is uh, not always the case in a uh, discourse world. So discourse wo world is the first level that text world theory works on. And the second level, which focuses on the text world that is created, uh, will be discussed in future lectures. Understanding the volitional aspect of communication is key to understanding the discourse process as a whole. Um, 
as all languages are created deliberately and communication is always for a purpose and it is also expected from each of the communicators to want to communicate. They are expected to have a will to engage in a conversation and in incrementing each other's knowledge. When this happens, a discourse world comes into being. The communicators who initiate it are known as participants in the discourse world in textual theory terms. Check out this example, which Gavin uh, brings. Again, she's speaker number one, S1. I'll have a chicken sandwich, please. Sure. What kind of cheese? No, a chicken sandwich. Sure. What kind of cheese? I don't want cheese. It's included. You mean I have to have cheese? No, you don't have to have it, but you're playing for it. But I can have a sandwich without cheese? I guess. Okay, I'll just have chicken on its own, then. No cheese? No cheese. S1, a 32 years old English academic visiting both the US and a well-known sandwich chain for the first time and S2, an adolescent American sandwich shop assistant. Although a common language is shared here, a considerable knowledge gap still exists between Gavins and her co-participant in the discourse world. It is clear from the conversation that at least to begin with, Gavins is lacking crucial knowledge which might help her achieve her aim. Knowledge, or the lack of it, plays a critical role in all discourse. Now I'm quoting from her book. I do not give up my attempts to buy a sandwich, neither after the first apparent misunderstanding nor the second. This is because I'm assuming throughout the exchange that my co-participant is as purposeful in her contribution to the conversation as I am in mine. The basic expectation is the driving force behind both our behavior. When the language we produce is met with confusion, we can repeat, restructure, clarify, and explain until we are satisfied that our communicative aims have been successful. She ended up getting the sandwich. The discourse world then can be seen as an act of negotiation, a process of negotiation. And what is being negotiated between the participants is, uh, of the discourse world is the precise na nature of the text world they are constructing in each other's mind. In fact, the participant in any given discourse world will normally be making use of several different types of knowledge at once. In this example, it is the English language, the fast food shop script, the sandwich model, etc. This transfer of knowledge from the private one's brain to the public, to somebody else's uh, ownership, which forms the primary basis of, uh, of the discourse, is known an, as incrementation. So this experiential knowledge helps to negotiate our way through all kinds of novel occurrences and this negotiation helps the participants in the discourse world uh, negotiate their way through all kinds of new occurrences on a daily basis, expanding and adjusting uh, the personal knowledge as they go along mismatch in cultural knowledge between Gavins and the shop assistant was significant enough to cause a real communication problem. She knew neither that all sandwiches sold in this sandwich shop come with a choice of uh, different cheeses, nor that uh, just about all sandwiches in the states of Wisconsin 
the dairy state of America, as she later learned, come with cheese as a standard ingredient. As a result of the sandwich uh, conversation, Gavin's incremented her knowledge about this chain and about the United States in general. The essentially negotiated nature of the discourse world meant that the cultural uh, knowledge gap between Govins and her co-participant did not in the end prevent the fulfillment, fulfillment of her aims. Because Govins assumed throughout the conversation that her co-participant was communicating willfully and because she assumed the same of, of she assumed the same of Govins. They both invested an extra effort required in the situation to make the conversation work. The basic and intuitive communication instance of face-to-face -face conversation changes in the case of split discourse worlds. A split discourse world happens when the participants in the discourse world do not share time and space. Discourse worlds can be split for a number of reasons. A telephone conversation, for example. The participants are communicating at the same temporal point, but are normally at some physical distance from one another. In recorded discourse, such as a pre-recorded radio program, the participants share neither their physical space nor a common time, and also in the majority of written communication. This disjunction means that certain comprehension aids available to participants in the here and now of face-to-face -face communication such as uh, intonation and gestures that we used in the sandwich shop, for example, are either inaccessible or irrelevant in the split discourse world. In spite of the willfulness to communicate on both sides, the narrowness of information could disturb the understanding of the communication in split discourse world, more even than the face-to-face -face communications that we saw above. Gavin brings the following example to illustrate this difficulty. Hopley, Dom. Michael O.S.P. died 24th of August 2001. Loved and missed by brother, sisters, cousins, nieces, nephews, great nieces and nephews, his many friends far and wide and his community at Ealing. Abbey. Daily Telegraph, August 24th, 2005. So the lack of objects of the physical world and the actual co-participant in a split discourse world results in only the text remaining as a sort of information from which knowledge can be incremented. And in the case of this in memoriam announcement, there's no real clarity as to even who the co-participant in the discourse world is. The wide distribution of the Daily Telegraph uh, newspaper means that uh, there are many possible readers of this text and thus many possible environments on the readerly side of the equation. I am, says Gavins, only one of these possible readers uh, located in the discourse world of my kitchen in Sheffield. Her only access to the co-participant if is through the text announcement. And despite its position as a public announcement in a national newspaper and the English language which Gavin shares with the author, her incrementation of knowledge from this text is by no means straightforward. A number of features of the announcement create obstacle for her understanding. First, First of all, as we said, the absence of the co-participant, the lack of knowledge about the co-participant. Gavins does not know what her co-participant looks like, the gender, age, all these things that are giving clue to the, to the meaning of the text. This particular text further complicates uh, Gavins' incrementation of knowledge by not providing even the name of the author as one would expect from a news report and a piece of uh, literary fiction. This may seem like a minor omission, but information, much information can be gathered from names. 
The second major obstacle to her understanding of the discourse occurs when trying to deduce whether or not she, the reader, Gavins, in this case, is part of the intended audience. Since no, since no direct address is made, like dear readers or not even dear readers, no co-participant is specified. Deciding one's own position within the discourse world thus becomes further part of the puzzle to be solved regarding this text. Since the friends and family of the deceased presumably already know their loved one is dead, one might reasonably question what other communicative needs are met by this in memoriam announcement. Gavin's ponders whether this was not the request of the deceased himself to have such an announcement. There's no solution to this. The important thing is to learn to be aware of the negotiating moments found among the participants in a discourse world, even when it is a split discourse world. In light of this, it is now time to explain your assignment. And this week, it is already concerned uh, with the anthology Gaza Writes Back. I have linked four video clips from YouTube to the assignment below the lecture. All are concerned with uh, Gaza Writes Back. And here is what you have to do. Watch clips one, two, and three, and tell who are the intended audience of each of those. Are you the intended audience? Explain why you think so. Then, number two, watch the two sequences in clip four, and these are these are the two uh, sequences from zero until three minutes and 45 seconds, the introduction, and from uh, minute nine and 22 seconds until the end, which is a dialogue. So watch these and tell of two places where the communication did not go smoothly. That is, one party did not accept the communication of the other. Both cases are in the second uh, sequence. The first one is only to introduce you to the sequence. Submit the answer of around 200 words in the assignment link found below this lecture. Thank you for listening and see you next time.